俺はまた行くのかあの島へ I originally wasn't going to make a part 2 to the Steve video, however, after revisiting the first thesis and watching Game Theory's take on Steve's power, I had to correct the misconceptions I had created, even if nobody asked. Regardless, let's start correcting the misconceptions of the first video. If we take Steve to be in a survival world, granted with no cheats or exploits, essentially a hardcore world, the absolute max amount of items he can hold occurs when his inventory and offhand are filled with shulker boxes, and when all of those shulker boxes are filled with items. Thus, the amount of inventory slots Steve would have are 38 shulker boxes in his inventory multiplied by 27, the amount of slots in each shulker box, giving Steve a maximum inventory slot space of 126 slots. If we take a gold block to have a density of Z, Z as a placeholder for the real value of 19,300 kilograms because I want to show you something. Knowing density to be the mass divided by the volume of an object, D equals M divided by V. The mass of a single gold block is equal to the mass of 9 gold ingots, since 9 gold ingots make up a gold block. Well, set a single gold bar to have a mass of G, since we don't know the real mass yet, a single netherite ingot has 4 gold ingots in it, and thus, we'll set the mass of a single netherite ingot to be N. A netherite block has 9 of these netherite ingots in it, giving it a total mass of 9N. 9N, since we're just adding up the mass of the 9 netherite ingots, which each entire ingot has a mass of N, thus 9N. Well. N is just the mass of 4 gold ingots, so N equals the mass of 4 gold ingots, or N equals 4G, since N equals 4G, and a netherite block has a mass of 9N, and through the equal sign, N is the same thing as saying 4G, we can substitute in 4G for N, and get that the mass of a single netherite block is equal to the mass of 9 times 4G, or the mass of 36 gold ingots. Now, let's do some more classy math. None of that Y equals MX plus B sh if a gold block's mass is known at 19,300 kilograms, and a gold block is composed of 9 gold ingots, this must mean that the mass of 9 gold ingots equals 19,300 kilograms, since the mass of the gold block is composed of 9 gold ingots. Instead of dividing by 9, isolating for the variable, boring, non-classy math, which will just waste our time, let's instead find out how much heavier a netherite block is than a gold block. That way we do less work. Similar to what we did before, if a gold block is composed of 9 gold ingots and a netherite block is composed of 36 gold ingots, a netherite block has 4 times more gold ingots than a gold block, which can be found when we take the ratio between the two blocks, 9 to 36 simplifies down to 1 to 4. Therefore, for every 1 gold ingot in a gold block, there are 4 gold ingots in a netherite block, which should mean the mass of a netherite block is also 4 times more, since it has 4 times more ingots. Thus, instead of simplifying for the gold ingots, we can just multiply 19,300 kilograms for a gold block by 4, which gives us a mass for a netherite block of 77,200 kilograms for each netherite block, which upholds our 1 to 4 ratio for each gold to netherite block. Now, if the somewhat classy math bored you, let's get into the more fun stuff. Since we know that Steve must have a maximum of 1,026 inventory slots and netherite blocks are stackable up to 64, assuming a shulker box does not transfer mass to another dimension and instead has a direct effect on Steve, the total number of stacks of netherite blocks Steve can have are 1,026 stacks of 64 netherite blocks, which when multiplied by 64 netherite blocks is 65,664 netherite blocks in his total inventory. If we multiply this by the mass of a single netherite block, we get that for 65,664 netherite blocks, the mass in kilograms must be 5.069 times 10 raised to the 9th kilograms, found by multiplying 65,664 netherite blocks by the mass of a netherite block, which is 77,200 kilograms, and we'll add on 206,000 kilograms if Steve is wearing full netherite armor plus 490 kilograms, which is Steve's own mass found through a quick Google search. This mass is more than a third of the Earth's mass, or 72,418,011 average humans' mass which is, coincidentally, also three times the population of Canada. Since this is conclusively the ultimate amount of mass Steve can carry in survival mode with no cheats, glitches, or abusive game mechanics, we'll take this to be the ceiling of Steve's mass. 
The normal force on Steve's legs would have to be 1.6 times 10 raised to the 11th newtons, found by taking Steve's mass multiplied by the gravity of a Minecraft world, which is around 32 meters per second squared. Similarly, what this would mean is that Steve's legs can hold up around 40 million African elephants on the low end. Now, with all this aside, what I really wanted to brush up on from the previous video, aside from the updated max mass Steve can hold, was if Steve was simultaneously using a potion of swiftness and power. With a potion of swiftness, speed from a beacon, and speed jumping boosts from a beacon, Steve can reach a maximum speed of 7.55 plus minus 0.1 meters per second, which is what I'll take to be Steve's maximum speed, factoring in air resistance in Minecraft. The speed, however, is useless to us if we can't find out the force Steve is exerting to reach zero net acceleration in a system with air resistance. Luckily for us, we can map a function to show how the physical values of Steve change while he is moving throughout the continuous time and space. The velocity vector is found through a differential equation. We first take the net force to be the sum of all forces. If we take the right to be the positive direction and left to be the negative direction, the sum of all forces is F net equals force Steve minus force air resistance equal to mass of Steve acceleration of Steve's minus C V squared. Force Steve being positive since Steve is moving to the right and the air resistance is stopping him from accelerating, creating a force on him to the left. If it's confusing, let's go through the air resistance equation where C is just a constant being one half rho AC and V is how fast Steve is moving through the air for the air resistance equation. Substituting in F net to be just mass times acceleration, being the acceleration of the system, and dividing by the mass, we have that acceleration is equal to acceleration equals acceleration Steve minus C divided by M V squared. The mass disappears from the left hand side since we divided the entire equation by it and we'll just call C divided by M K instead. Since acceleration is just the derivative of velocity with respect to time, we can substitute in this differential, and we have our differential equation dv divided by dt equals acceleration steve minus kv squared. But now, how do we solve a differential equation like this? Well, the most notable aspect is that dv divided by dt is separable. Separating the two sides of the differential, we get that the integral of the left-hand side, a minus cv squared dv, equals the integral of 1 dt, which we get after dividing both sides by a minus cv squared, and multiplying both sides by dt. Integrating the left hand side by using partial fraction decomposition after the use of the factoring by the difference of two squares, we can integrate our left hand side after using a u substitution, which I can explain in another video if requested, since otherwise this one will get too long. After integrating, we have that the natural log of the square root of a plus the square root of k times v minus natural log square root a minus square root k times v divided by 2 square root 8 times k equals t plus c. Again, c just being a different constant than before. Multiplying both sides by the denominator, 2 square root a times k, then applying e to both sides to get rid of the natural log, we get that our equation is then e raised to the square root a times k times t plus c equals square root a plus square root k times v divided by square root a minus square root k times v. And since this fraction is just begging to be multiplied by its conjugate, that's what we'll do. Multiplying by the conjugate of the bottom, which is square root a plus square root k times v, we have that the equation is now e raised to the square root a times k times t plus c equals square root a plus square root k times v squared divided by a minus k v squared. With this, we can multiply out the top part of the fraction and move the denominator to the other side to get a quadratic equation, which is now a times e raised to the square root a times k times t plus c minus kv squared times e raised to the square root a times k times t plus c equal to a plus 2 square root a times k times v plus v squared. Since we now have a quadratic equation, moving everything to one side would be ideal, since we can now solve the equation for the square and then easily solve for the velocity as a function of time. So let's do that now, which then gets us that 0 equals v squared plus k v squared times e raised to the square root a times k times t plus c plus 2 square root a times k times v plus a minus a times e raised to the square root a times k times t plus c. 
With all the quadratic terms on one side and all the linear and constant terms in their own brackets, we can complete the square, which takes the form of adding on b divided by 2 squared to both sides of the equation after dividing all the terms by a if a is not equal to 1. A somewhat necessary prerequisite for completing the square, which will make our life easier. We can factor out v squared from the first two terms of the equation, leaving us with the a term, which is a equals 1 plus ke raised to the square root a times k times t plus c, which will divide on both sides, leaving us with the b term of b equals 2 square root a times k, 1 plus ke raised to the square root a times k times t plus c, which will then add on b divided by 2 squared to both sides, giving us square root a times k divided by 1 plus ke raised to the square root a times k times t plus c squared minus a minus a times e raised to the square root a times k times t plus c divided by 1 plus k times e raised to the square root a times k times t plus c equal to v squared plus 2 square root a times k times v divided by 1 plus k e raised to the square root a times k times t plus c plus square root a times k divided by 1 plus k e raised to the square root a times k times t plus c squared. Completing the square then leaves us with square root a times k divided by 1 plus k times e raised to the square root a times k times t plus c squared minus a minus a times e raised to the square root a times k times t plus c divided by 1 plus k times e raised to the square root a times k times t plus c equivalent to v plus square root a times k divided by 1 plus k times e raised to the square root a times k times t plus c squared. Since when factoring and completing the square method, the inside of the factor part is just going to be b divided by 2. Now that our function is factored, we can finally solve for the variable of interest v, which after doing algebra, we have that v of t equals square root square root a times k divided by 1 plus k times e raised to the square root a times k times t plus c squared minus a minus a times e raised to the square root a times k times t plus c divided by 1 plus k times e raised to the square root a times k times t plus c minus the square root a times k divided by 1 plus k times e raised to the square root a times k times t plus c with c just being a constant for the general equation which we can find in our equation after plugging in the values of 1 for t and 6.77 for v into our equation since those are the values steve is at at time equals 1 and steve is running at 6.77 meters per second which we can now plug into our equation to solve for c with c being 0. we have our final equation as that mess with c equals 0 which gives a graph like this now this is only the velocity for steve moving in the horizontal direction since he's also jumping, he has a vertical velocity, which is equal to a function as well, mainly v of t y equals minus 32t plus 12.8. This function repeats every 24 over 30 seconds, since that's how long it takes Steve to reach the ground, and thus we can create a floor function of velocity for Steve, with v in the upward direction being Steve's velocity upwards. Since this function repeats indefinitely for as long as Steve is moving, we can convert this into a four-year series which is then represented as a sawtooth wave with a period of 24 over 30 seconds and an amplitude of 12.8. Since this function repeats indefinitely for as long as Steve is moving, we can create a function for this too, mainly either through using a Fourier series or the floor function, which is then represented as a sawtooth wave with a period of 24 over 30 seconds and an amplitude of 12.8 meters per second, which is also the maximum velocity Steve attains moving upwards. Thus, the function can be described by v of ty equals pi minus 12.8 divided by 24 divided by 30 plus 12.8 floor x divided by 24 over 30 plus 12.8 minus 5 pi over 2 plus pi minus 12.8 divided by 24 over 30 plus 12.8 floor x divided by 24 over 30 minus 12.8 plus 5 pi divided by 2 minus 2.098 which represents the function for the velocity vector in the upward direction, and as a cleaner and nicer Fourier series, the function for Steve's upward velocity can be represented by v of t y equals 20.48, the summation from n equals 1 to infinity of sine 2 pi n times x divided by 0.8 divided by pi times n. Now, finally taking the two functions and taking the sum of the two horizontal and vertical vectors, we have that the total velocity for Steve in any direction is now v of t equals square root v of t x squared plus v of t y squared, found throughout the use of the Pythagorean theorem. With this, if we take the derivative of the function, we get the acceleration function, and the integral will give us the distance, which can then give us functions for our force, momentum, kinetic energy, power, 
all as functions of time, which can explain the changing physical attributes of Steve as he moves through space. After substituting in the previously found equations for Steve's velocity in the horizontal and vertical directions, we get a function so long I won't even read it. And if we take the derivative of this function, we get acceleration, which can then come out to another function, which is, again, way too long to say. So I'll just put it up on screen for you real quick. What this basically means is that after a few seconds due to the air resistance, Minecraft Steve's acceleration will reach a peak of 32.7 meters per second, which we can then use to find the force and other equations. Instead of using the functions for velocity, we can just use the maximum velocity, since we're looking for a ceiling to Steve's physical quantities. So, the maximum velocity is 15.281 meters per second. With this, we can find out the real value for each of Steve's physical quantities, his force being f equals ma, r 32.7 meters per second times 5.07 times 10 raised to 9th kilograms, which is a force of 6.77 times 10 raised to 10th newtons, a momentum of 7.7 .7 times 10 raised to 9th, a kinetic energy of 5.92 times 10 raised to 11th joules, power of 1.03 times 10 raised to 12th watts, and a punch strength of, assuming he's running at max speed and hits an item just before he lands his jump, his punch strength would be 2.57 times 10 raised to 11th newtons. With all this considered, where did game theory go wrong? Where did I go wrong? It has to do with the ability to stack the blocks and items which I had messed up, as I had assumed that shulker boxes were stackable, which would lead to all of Steve's physical quantities aside from acceleration and velocity going to infinity. But where did game theory go wrong? Well, it's a little bit of stretching the truth, which isn't too bad. However, the NBT method found by Sankarn, which game theory used to assume Steve's mass was very near a huge number, was only applicable in creative mode. So all things considered, it was already decided that Steve had to have immense power and physical capabilities in creative mode. So in my opinion, although Game Theory's math was spot on, what they got wrong was saying Steve doing the same thing in survival mode. In survival mode, Steve's power trends to the numbers I stated, not nearing a black hole, but just an average Minecraft human, however average Steve is. However, as in creative mode, Game Theory's calculations would hold, as the NBT method is applicable in creative mode, and therefore, chests iterable up to 512 bits, leading to a mass near infinity and beyond. Since Game Theory used gold blocks and we found that nether blocks are 4 times as heavy. Although it may be unfortunate to some of us to discover that Steve isn't near as powerful as we have thought, there is light to the situation that it's only for survival mode where Steve isn't this powerful. And say in creative mode, all the math and physical quantities derived and discovered work for Steve and his mass and all other physical quantities do trend to infinity, basically having Steve create a black hole himself and be ultra powerful. However, only and only if he's in creative mode.